wanted to chat about something that popped up in my stories when I shared about a little boy that I work with who has been, you know, really kind of bouncing around. He doesn't have any Montessori experience, um, but he he came to me, he's seven, and he's just been kind of bouncing around with the materials, not really getting involved in anything, not really connecting with anything. And so I shared about the process that I've taken um, in order to help him connect. And I shared about how he eventually, after a month, connected with the trinomial cube. So when I shared my observations and my stories, I got a ton of comments and, and likes. And what jumped out at me was parents who were telling me, oh my gosh, I didn't know that this is how Montessori worked. I didn't know that you had to present without expecting your child to connect with the materials and that eventually one of the materials would work for your child, right? So apparently what's happening is people think that if they prepare materials, put them on the shelves and then present them to their child, their child is going to connect with every material. And that if they're not connecting with the material, then it's the parent's fault or the guide's fault, right? Um, and that they're not doing something right or else that Montessori doesn't work, that Montessori doesn't work for their child, doesn't work for their family. And so what I want to talk about today is dispelling that myth, okay? Let's take our ego out of our presentations. Presentations are gifts. And just like you give a gift without, you know, hopefully expecting the person to, to give you something in return, or, you know, it's nice if they were excited about the gift, but if they're not, if you really gave the gift from your heart, then it's okay if they're not excited. You just keep on going and you keep giving and uh, giving without expectation. And so that is how we need to present. And so I want to jump in a little bit to this book that's called, there we go, Children Who Are Not Yet Helpful. Um, this book was transformative for me when I became an elementary guide. It's written by Donna Bryant Gertz, I think is how you pronounce her name. Um, and she was an elementary Montessori guide um, and school owner for over 30 years. And she was the, um, the founder of Austin Montessori School. If you ever get a chance to go, it is a truly remarkable school. And she writes about her experience as working with children who are not yet peaceful or not yet normalized, right? Especially elementary children who come into the elementary without a Montessori background and who really struggle to connect with the materials. And uh, I know that uh, a lot of you, or some of you, have come in to Montessori with older kids without having a background, and you're learning yourself as you go along, right? So let's see what Donna suggests and, and what Donna uh, says is, is happening, right? And she says, children who are surrounded at home by excess in the way of toys and pampering require greater talent and effort on the part of the teacher or the homeschool parent over a longer period of time to reach regular, deep, and lengthy engagement, or what we call flow. Um, children who lead less cluttered and indulged lives respond more immediately to the Montessori classroom. Now, most of our children lead more or less pampered lives, right? Most of us uh, give them lifestyles that don't let them want for anything. They don't lack anything. Um, but we need to be really careful because we can overwhelm them and not just with things. So this idea of decluttering is not just about decluttering their, their toys or their bedrooms or even decluttering the Montessori shelves. It's about decluttering their life in general. So starting with screen time, right? So reduce screen time and consider the quality of the screen time. Um, also notice the, the routine, the rhythm of their lives. Are their days predictable? And even if your days are all different because you work or they have classes or whatever, are you letting them know what their day is going to look like? Because for children, knowing what the day is going to be about gives them security. And that security allows their mind to relax and allows them to focus on their work, their developmental work. Step number two in helping your child connect with their own development is to educate yourself. Why is this so important? So diving into what your child's sensitive periods are, where, what are they going through, um, and then what the Montessori principles are will allow you to create a better experience for your child um, when you get to step number three, right? So if you know what uh, sensitive periods to look for, then when you're observing and presenting, you'll be able to connect your child to materials that resonate with them. Same thing. If you Put your hands on the materials when you're practicing with them and think about not just the lesson that you're presenting, but 
what is the material representing? What concept is the material representing? And, and, and have it make sense to you. And when you do that, then you're going to be in a much better position to use the material as a developmental tool and not just as a teaching apparatus. Um, the more that you get your hands on the material, the more that you will see the connections to real life. And then when your child asks a question or shows an interest, then you'll say, oh, that material answers that child's question. One of my favorite things about Montessori that I discovered when I, when I became an elementary guy was that the, the, the curriculum or the lessons are developed based on the children's questions. Dr. Montessori and her son Mario worked for years with, with you know, hundreds of children, thousands of children around the world, and they recorded the questions these children had, and they developed lessons based on these questions. So for example, the other day my daughter asked, where does our bread come from? How many people are involved in getting our bread to our table? I was like, oh my gosh, the economic interdependence lesson. Um, and the same happens, you know, with everything, you know, if they ask, like, if it's daytime right now, where is it nighttime? Are people sleeping right now? Or is everybody awake around the world? All of those questions are like, oh, there's a lesson for that, right? It's like, there's an app for that. There is a lesson for that. So this requires that you are familiar with the lessons. It, it doesn't mean that you need to know every single lesson by heart. It means that you need to be familiar with the materials. So and step number three is observe your child, right? And, and what do I mean by observe? It's sit down, not just while they're working with the materials, but throughout the day and notice what they are connecting with um, outdoors, what questions they're asking, what their, their statements and their behaviors are telling you. And if you understand a little bit about the uh, sensitive periods, then you'll be able to say, oh, my child is showing me that he's in that sensitive period. So let me think about how I can connect. So then you start to, to use Montessori from a developmental perspective and fit Montessori um, in a way that supports your child, as opposed to trying to fit your child into a lockstep curriculum, right? That a lot of people think that Montessori is, but it's not. And so if, if you are working with a child, either as a guide or in, in your homeschool life, if you're working with a child that's just, you know, flitting from material to material, maybe disrupting other children, not really connecting. Um, here's what Donna says. I have come to expect a passion to develop and trigger the concentration essential to every child's healing and growth. Sooner or later, passion will lead to concentration. Whereas during the primary years, ages three to six, this process usually takes only a year or less. At the elementary level, it can sometimes take as long as two or three years, right? So if you're thinking like, holy cow, what am I going to do for two or three years until my child hits their groove? It, it, it doesn't really work that way. It's not like your child is going to be flitting around or uh, you know, not connecting with anything for two or three years and then suddenly they're normalized. Um, what it means is that you will see glimmers, right? You will see glimmers, just like with this child that, that, that I'm working with. Eventually after, I mean, I, I had him working with me for gosh, like six, seven sessions, um, if not more. And he didn't connect with anything. I tried everything that I had on my shelves, pretty much. Um, and then eventually it was the trinomial cube. Now my, my, my challenge is to see, okay, where can I take him next? But the beautiful part about that one connection is that I see the glimmer. I see that kindling of concentration, of self-control, um, that drive to keep working and to make mistakes and then overcome them. And so that lets me know that I'm not alone, okay? And I think that's, this is the crux of what I want to tell you. Dr. Montessori was a genius because she worked alongside nature. And you have all of her tools, all of her observations. And so your job is just to be a conduit between the brilliance of what she developed to support development and nature, right? Your child is a creature of nature. And by design, they have these drives, these sensitivities, these tendencies within them. And so, like I said, our job is to declutter their lives, slow down their lives so that these, these tools that you now have, that you're learning about, that you're, you're purchasing or creating, that you're setting up on your shelves, that these tools and this child, this nature, this force of nature can connect together. You are just the conduit. And so if you see yourself that way, it's a lot easier to take your ego out of it and not feel like a failure if your initial efforts are not working. 
So the last thing that I want to leave you with is the last uh, quote from, from Donna, because a lot of us might be tempted to go back to traditional methods, right? Like, oh, this Montessori thing is not working. We're just wasting our time. My child is falling behind. They're not on track. Everybody else on Instagram is doing amazing stuff and I'm not. So I'm just going to go back to traditional methods. And why do we go back to traditional methods? Because most of us, that's what we were raised with, right? And so then we think, well, at least that way there's a worksheet. Um, you know, it shows that I did something and, um, and I feel good knowing that, um, that at least I, you know, checked off that box. The problem is that most of the time children don't go there willingly because their internal drive, right? That, that force of nature that they have rejects this this kind of standardized and forced type of education and even if they do the worksheet it's not going to be internalized in the same way and it's not going to have the same effect the same developmental effect they might you know they might learn how to spell but it's not going to have the same developmental effect the same effect in the formation of their person to their maximum potential as it would have if we stuck with a method that has been proven for over a hundred years to fundamentally and 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 thoroughly support a child's development so here is donna's quote in the beginning it seems better just to return to traditional methods as i was sorely tempted to do almost weekly i suppose i hung in there simply because i believed my work could not do more damage than traditional work does and might even one day become easier more clear and more certain after over 30 years of practice i can see the long path behind me clearly in retrospect it looks so certain that i have more confidence right? Each situation is new, but the method is the same. And I can feel when I've gone astray. I have confidence now that I will eventually find the way with a child, whether it happens today, next month, or next year. And she says, besides with most of the children, I have three or four years. Now she's a, she was a guide. She had three or four years with them. Think about the gift that we have as homeschoolers. We have, if you're a long-term homeschooler and you're in it for the long haul, you have your child's entire childhood. You have your child's entire childhood to connect with them, to help them understand who they are. And even if you do it little by little, even if they resonate with just a couple of materials at a time, um, that is what your child is asking, right? They're asking to be respected, to be followed, to live uncluttered lives, and to be trusted, to have an adult that keeps the ego out of the equation and an adult that can love them for who they are, educate themselves in order to be better guides and then just support them and guide them in their own unique path. So I hope that you found this helpful. Um, I, it, it really kind of touched my heart to get so many comments saying, I thought it was me. I thought I wasn't a good guide. I thought I wasn't doing Montessori right. Um, and so hopefully with these, with these pointers, with these quotes, with this inspiration, you will be able to look at your path in a whole different way. If you want more support, if you want to work with me directly, I invite you to join the hub. I have over 150 parents, um, and a lot of them I've been working with for over a year, and it's been remarkable to see their transformation. Um, they came with a lot of uncertainty and anxiety, and now I see them just blossoming, and all the time I get messages saying, I'm having such a great homeschool year. This year is so different from last year. I feel so much more confident my children are blossoming, and uh, and it's all because they put in the work of understanding the sense sensitive periods, understanding who their children are, preparing themselves, getting their hands on the materials, and then putting that ego aside and just giving their children the gift of presentations without ego.